Originals. Let's buy the green machine. Today we're going to talk to Pauline Black. Well, hello there. Pauline, tell us a little about yourself and the era in which you came to prominence. The era in which I, well, when I say I, as part of the selector, as the lead singer of selector, uh, came to any kind of prominence in uh, in the UK, for sure, was uh, 1979. I... And in about March of that year... I was trying to put together a reggae band with some friends of mine, a guy called Silverton, who was the drummer before John Bradbury in the specials. Um, he'd suddenly become free of the specials, so <laughs> he was around. And um, a guy called Desmond Brown, who was playing a really, really tasty sort of Hammond organ. And we were all rehearsing in some dingy old pub in Coventry on the Foles Hill Road. And suddenly Linville Golding from the specials, the rhythm guitarist of the specials, came in. And, uh, and he looked all shiny and new. He looked as though he'd gone and bought some really shiny kind of pants and things, you know, because he was making some money. So we were all in awe of this and thought, wow, he's just been on tour with The Clash and things like this because he'd been supporting The Clash. And he went, okay, you, you and you, which was myself and Desmond Brown and another drummer, but he was playing bass in this outfit. You come and meet this guy. So we just went to this house, and in that house was a guy called Neil Davis who um, wrote uh, The Selector, which is, was an instrumental track. And that was on the flip side of Gangsters, the specials Gangsters. And we all dutifully sat around in this room and listened to this track, nodding our heads kind of thing, saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great, Neil, that's great. And at the end of it, kind of Neil said, well, I need to put a band together because, you know, it's going up the chart. So we said, okay, we'll help. And we did. And within six months, I think it was, we were on the two-tone tour with Madness and the Specials, which is really cool. That was about 40 dates. And that saw us into 1980. And at the same time, I think in about October of 1979, sort of Specials, Madness and Selector all had top ten hits. Yeah, yeah. And were they all on two-tone or similar-sized labels? All of them were on the two-tone label. That was the wonder of it, this tiny little old label, um, which was the brainchild, really, of Jerry Dammers, who is um, the keyboard player and uh, main songwriter from uh, the specials. It was... um, that was his baby, you know, the iconography of it, the black and white, the uh, the two-tone man kind of thing, what jabs go, all, all of those things were, were his ideas. And, um, you know, for me, that was a perfect fit. Right, 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 right. What inspired, I mean, I think I know what inspired on the radio, but can you explain how the song manifested itself? The song on my radio uh, manifested itself. It was already fully formed before we came along. Um, Neil had written that song but the part they didn't have was um, that high vocal on my radio and and, and all that kind of nonsense that all came together in the studio but uh, at the time just to put that in kind of context Jerry Damas had a deal with Chrysalis um, the record company and he was offered a label and what this label could do was give a thousand pounds to which was quite a lot of money in those days to any band of his choice that he thought would be good to be on this label to go into a studio and record three songs um, so we went into a 16 track studio Horizon right. Studios in Coventry oh, yeah. and uh, that was when you know things were done on two inch tape and splicing had to be done if you made a mistake so nobody needed to make a mistake and we recorded three tracks and on my radio was one of those tracks too much pressure was the other and there was another song called um street feeling which ended up on our first uh, album on the too much pressure 
album. But no one really, I think that some of the guys in the band thought that on my radio was just like the flakiest of songs <laughs> and uh, was more like some Eurovision song or something like that. But everybody thought that it would be a hit. So that was the one we went with. And also it was like two fingers up to the radio, uh, which was awful in those days. Um, absolutely dire. It sounded to me like it was slightly outside the strict scar or blue bee form and shape. What was the special ingredient? The voice, obviously, but rhythmically and structurally? I mean, the whole of two-tone. People talk about scar, they talk about scar revival and all those kind of things. Right. Really, it has a fairly tenuous kind of grasp of early scar. And I mean, by early scar, I mean the kind of stuff that the Scatolites right. did or Prince Buster did right. or, um, uh, you know, people like Laurel Aitken had, had, had come to this country and he was doing over in Leicester. Right. I mean, everybody at that time, Steel Pulse, all of those guys who we were all enthralled to because they were only over in Birmingham, uh, were choosing reggae as a medium and not just kind of, you know, Jamaican reggae, but black British reggae and Steel Pulse really were the precursors of that. So everybody wanted to be in a reggae band and suddenly Jerry Dammers came along and so I said, yeah, but there's this, this other kind of beat, you know, and I mean, it's faster, you can dance to it and you can mix it up with other things. You can mix it up with soul, you can mix it up with punk, you can mix it up with rock. And everybody chose something different to kind of mix it up with and that's where the change is. I mean, I bought a more kind of soulful punky edged kind of vocal to it yeah. and the rest of the guys I think very much within the selector because we were a predominantly black band six black guys and uh, you know one white kind of uh, guy I mean we had uh, I'd taken white guy <laughs> that's really just a terrible thing to say but uh, but everybody else uh, wasn't quite like that because the specials they only had two black guys in their band and Madness didn't have any at all I wonder why <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we were more reggae-based, I suppose. But all of us were completely manic when we got on a stage and um, just kind of, well, did anything, really, for that short space that you, you, you were on stage. Um, and we had fights, like during Too Much Pressure. We thought it would be a really, really good idea because there you... We had a situation quite often where a lot of right-wing skinheads would turn up to the gigs and decide that it was a really good idea to Zeke Kyle at you while you were singing, which was... Um, I don't know, people might think that was fairly bizarre now, but, I mean, it was pretty kind of average for a day's work on stage in those days. <laughs> and uh, multiculturalism was a complete and utter no-no for a lot of people. So we were introducing people to actually looking at bands where black and white people were on the stage. And we thought, well, they're all fighting in the audience, so why don't we have a mock fight on stage during too much pressure to show them what the hell it looks like? It really doesn't look good. And But, of course, everybody thought that we were having a ruck as well. <laughs> so it kind of backfired. <laughs> all right, I hear you. But what kind of shit you come up against as the female lead of a band? If I actually look back now, and this is looking back with hindsight, um, only because the whole thing about gender is now on the books, as it were, I think that if I was actually going to say how I felt about myself now, I've never felt about myself as having a gender. You know, I'm married to a guy, but I've never ever felt within myself that, oh, well, I, you know, I'm a female and that's it. And I'm in a band and this is really awkward because blah, 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 blah. Um, it's, I never really felt like that. I just leapt on stage and I did what I did. I did it. I didn't do it as, as kind of, you know, a female or flying some flag for females somewhere. I mean, it didn't, really didn't mean anything to me. Whether that's bundled up with my idea of how I feel about race and all of those kind of things and being a black woman, that's another thing. But you can't be what you can't see, right? So I didn't really have anything that I felt that I connected with. I mean, what did I have? I had Tina Turner. Well, you know, if you want to be a fiery female and all the rest of it, she was really, really great. But I couldn't wear short skirts like that. You know, I couldn't look as though the elastic had gone between my knees. <laughs> Alright, so tell me, did you vibe with the punk scene? Get on with bands like The Clash? Or not? I didn't really take too much notice of what guys did in bands. Um, I admired The Clash. I admired their songs, but didn't really mean anything particularly to me. 
Um, they were just a bunch of white boys who were doing a thing. I mean, there, there, there were loads of bands who were doing a thing at that time. Um, I, I admired their energy. I admired their subject matter and all of those kind of things. But, I mean, John Lydon, I mean, oh, please, you know. It's um, really didn't come on my radar at all um, as, as uh, what they stood for because it didn't really have anything to do with me. When I saw people like polystyrene from X-Ray Specs, that had everything to do with me. When I saw people like, um, you know, Viv Albertine um, from The Slits and Ari Up, that had everything to do with me. So that's what I looked at. Um, I'm not really interested in some, you know... Um, these genres change from decade. If you live long enough, which I have, I am now 64 <laughs> years old. If you live long enough, you've seen all these bands, you know, and it's and historically you look back and you may think about, yeah, well, the Clash did that and and um, the Sex Pistols did that. All of those things were absolutely glorious and absolutely wonderful. But there is a whole litany of uh, bands um, which are all seemingly doing something that. Um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males do and I'm not that bloody interested no disrespect you know when you're getting props uh, it seems like more money more problems is that what happened to you? I think the one thing that the two-term movement managed to do was largely to hold its integrity because most of the people that were involved in it had come from working-class backgrounds, had worked themselves. I mean, I'd worked. I'd worked in the NHS. Uh, I was originally from Romford and sort of, you know, got myself to Coventry and, and things like that to, to, to study, but... Um, I, I feel that a lot of people who kind of, you know, plodded their way through art school normally came from middle-class backgrounds. Um, and, uh, well, you know, I didn't read and think that much about those people at that time. It's all a bit cultural slumming, really, isn't it? Um, that's how I felt about it then. But, yeah, Two-Tone at the time, I think, was arguably one of the last kind of political movements in this country and occupied that uh, kind of cultural divide, you know, which would spawn, if you like, an idea of multiculturalism or that multiculturalism might work. You know, from a commercial aspect, it never really had that greater reach. I mean, we put out a lot of records in a very short space of time, but the only people really who made money out of Two-Tone was record companies. Right. As, as far as I can see, I mean, the specials only had two albums out there. We only had two albums out there before we all conveniently sort of almost murdered each other and split. <laughs> and then that goes for both bands, you know. And then Jerry went on to spend three years making the special AKA album and just wasted a lot of money at Wessex Studios. And by that time, the whole scene had moved on and you'd got all these other bands, you know, with a synth, two people in a synth or whatever, and dodgy haircuts. <laughs> it's about the worst nightmare for the 80s. I hated the 80s, you know, yeah. sort of both from uh, yeah, the most stylistically dodgy, um, well, no, the 70s are pretty crap too. <laughs> 60s, really good. I so uh, in terms of sellout, which of these decades stole the soul? Because I'm getting the sense that... Uh, all of them. All of them? All of them. Every single decade is guilty of cultural appropriation. A word? Ever since I sort of, you know, popped out of the womb and was told that <sighs> Bing Crosby invented jazz. <laughs> it's, uh, you, you, you can't say there wasn't a time when it, it still goes on today. Obviously, it is less now. But the main reason why that is less is because, you know... Black people, fortunately, maybe not so much in this country, but certainly in America, are beginning to own the means of production, if you kind of see what I mean. And that, I, I feel, was a huge sea change and was very fundamentally different, say, from what happened in Jamaica, where a whole bunch of middle-class white folk, like Chris Bratwell and people like that, kind of, you know, appropriated something and uh, rejigged it for, for uh, white ears over here and adding all kinds of bits and pieces that when you listen to, say, even Marley's kind of early stuff wasn't there. Maybe, maybe Scratch Perry had the right idea and just burnt the damn thing down. <laughs> yeah. 
So you think it's better to hit it hard and get out fast than hang around? I can only really talk for myself um, what I've ever been trying to do, I guess, within the music business with the chosen music that I've wished to to have any part of. And I would say that two-tone, yeah, it did burn for a very, very short time, but it did burn very brightly. So brightly that 40 years later, um, you know, bands like The Selector and The Beat and The Specials can still be out there. And, um, you know, some of us still making new music and making music about what's going on today. And uh, people being interested, you know, not millions of people or anything like that. We're living in a different day and age. I mean, you can't really sell records in the way that we sold records back then for love or money. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely for love and definitely not for the money. I mean, people do not stream any of those bands. But, um, you know, we can go to most countries in the world and have an audience. And I, I do feel that maybe our roots run a little deeper and people do think about new stuff that we do or at least are you know, pleased that we try and uh, do new music. Yeah, that's lovely. That's great. But uh, has your message or your purpose kind of changed over the decades? Uh, when people say to me, is the message the same now as what it was in 1979 when we started, um, then I think to myself, I think, right, has racism changed? Has sexism changed? And I look around me right now, and I think, if anything, it's got worse. Yeah. That's arguable, because a lot of people say, well, what about President Obama? Um, yeah, I mean, we had an eight-year blip where we thought, wow, that is great, isn't it? You know, the White House is, is kind of... has been invaded maybe this is all going to change and i think that uh, yeah there was some change it would be naive to say there wasn't it was uh, like i say you can't be what you can't see and i think that what whatever was really great about that period will probably come through um in the next generation over the next 20 years there's a whole generation of black kids growing up now that saw somebody running stuff you know properly running stuff and uh, yeah, that, that encourages me. But then I go and I travel in Europe and places like that, or I go to America sort of recently, and, and I listen to some of the fascist rumblings over there. And, um, and I think really people haven't learned very much at all. And this is just an ongoing fight. Yeah. And it will be ongoing forever. And um, the one thing that... I can do however small that may be right, is to right. keep those two issues with the, the, the message of two-tone, if there is a message, that black and white, those contradictions, right. just keep them at some kind of sharp edge of what I do creatively, and that's what I do. All right, last question. Any rays of hope at all? Who's out there? Who's tomorrow's people? Who's carrying that flag? You mentioned Little Sims, and, and I mean, it's just absolutely wondrous for me to look on a young woman kind of being that up from that forceful. You know, people like FKA Twigs, I think that what she does is absolutely wondrous. Um, marrying dance, marrying theatre, marrying sort of, you know, her own creative energies and this strange ethereal world that she conjures up. I, and, and, and these are all things that, you know, are going to flower and flower for the future. There isn't one kind of way of going about things, and it's no longer young white men in, in some ways kind of leading that whole charge all the time, and it's, you know, you're just swapping from genre to genre. Um, I think there is a mixing up of things, and you're growing up now with young people who have mixed culturally at school, you know, in the workplace, all of those things that my generation never really got the opportunity to do. Um, as far as I know, there ain't no colour bars around now. You know, you, you know what I mean? And there's plenty of black in the Union Jack. That's a beautiful line. Thank you so much, Pauline. That's absolutely amazing. I'm gonna take it for a ride. Podcast with Deezer. Now get out. <laughs>
Deezer. Deezer. Originals.